Okay. You're live. Hello, uh, this is Daniel. This is Brother Daniel. Greetings from Arizona in the United States to the Hawaii Kulak Bible Institute in Thailand. I thank Jesus for the opportunity to talk to you today, and let's pray and ask for his help now, okay? Jesus, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for um, giving your life for us. Help us understand your book and see how it applies to our life today. Bring honor to yourself through our lives. Amen. Okay, so the Bible teaches us who God is and who we are. It explains why God made us, why we walked away from God, and how God intervened to bring us back to God. To, to make a nice building, you need all kinds of different parts, right? You need a floor, a foundation, right? You need walls, and then you need something to make a roof out of, right? And the Bible has different parts to it also that are like different parts of a house. The part we're going to start with is the floor, which in the Bible is the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is like a floor. And the this will be the first of ten lessons, which will explain how the different parts of the Bible fit together. So all of the other parts rest on the book of Genesis. If you don't understand the book of Genesis, you won't understand the rest of the Bible either. Genesis 1, 2, and 3 are so important that I would encourage you during your time in Bible school to actually memorize those three chapters because you'll use them for the rest of your life and whatever kind of ministry God puts you in, you'll, you'll use the truths you learn in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. So in our first lesson today, we're going to be looking just at creation, which is Genesis chapters 1 and 2. First of all, let's think about what these chapters teach us about God. Well, first we learn that God created everything, and there's only one God. The very first thing the Bible tells us is that God created the heavens and the earth. So God exists. Some other religions said that there were many different gods involved in creating the world, and that the gods sometimes disagreed and got into fights about how to make the world, and so that um, they would destroy each other's work or cause problems. But the Bible starts out by telling us there's only one God, and this God does exactly what he wants to do. He doesn't have any other competition. We also learn from this, because it says, in the beginning, God, right? So God existed even before the beginning. God is eternal, but the world, the universe, is not eternal. So there was a beginning to time, space, and matter. Before the beginning, God always existed. But now, the universe exists. The universe is, is real. It's not just an illusion, like some religions teach. Third thing we learn is that God is not the same as his creation. God is separate. God is distinct from his creation. Because some religions say that everything is a part of God, that, that humans and animals and trees and rocks, they're all, they all have a part of God, they're all part of God. But it's obvious from looking at Genesis 1 that God is not his creation, and his creation is not God. Just like a writer is not the same as the book he's written. So the next thing we see is that God speaks. The way that God creates things is by talking. This shows that God is a person, not, not a force like gravity. He, he communicates and his words have power. So like if you go fishing and you go to the lake or the river and you say, hey fish, come here, come here, come to my hands. The fish, if it does anything, will probably swim away from you, right? But when God speaks, even the stars obey him. We can also see from this that God isn't in a hurry. Though he creates things very quickly, very easily, just speaks. He doesn't make everything at once. He, he spreads it out over six days. So God can work fast, but he's not in a hurry. Okay, next, we see that God is orderly. 
God does things in a sequence. He made different things on different days. On days one, two, and three, he, he separated things. On days one and four, he brought light to the darkness. On days two and five, he brought order and life to the sea. And on days three and six, he brought, he made the dry land and then put vegetation and the plants and uh, animals and finally humans on the land so that the land was no longer empty. He made light before he made the sun. He made the ocean before he made the fish. He made the dry land before he made you know, animals and humans. So, so we see that God is orderly and organized in the way he does things. Um, also, God never makes a mistake. He never you know, made an animal and looked at it like, ah, I don't like that, started over. Everything he made was perfect the very first try. Um, we also see that God evaluates or, or judges. God, God looks at his work. He says he looks at his work. He judged that it was good. He said um, God saw that it was good. Everything that God does is good. And we also see that God names some things in Genesis chapter 1. He, he gave names to the day and the night, the heavens, the seas, and the earth. Later, the Bible even tells us that God gave names to all the stars. This shows that God has authority over them because he named them. Um, just like a person who owns a dog or a cow often gives it a name, God owns the day, the seas, the heavens, and tells them what to do. Um, we can also learn from this that God is greater than than all the things people worship, everything else. You know, everything that people worship or, or fear or want, God made it. Um, so, you know, because like some people worship the sun or the moon, right? And God made those. Some people worship work or family or food. And God made all that. Um, some people want gold. And God made that. You know, and some people are afraid of snakes or lions. And God made them. So. Whatever um, people fear or worship or want, God made those things. So we should worship and want and fear God more than we worship or want or fear anything else. Because God made us, because God made this beautiful universe that we live in, God deserves our worship, God deserves our, our praise, our, our thanks, our gratitude. Um, even if God had never done anything else, we should still praise him for the beauty of the creation he's made and for the privilege we have of existing. The universe shows the beauty and the glory of God in the same way like a, like a beautiful painting shows the beauty of the artist. It gives honor to the artist when you see a beautiful painting. Like, wow, he's really got skill. When we see the beauty of creation, we should think of the Creator. Wow, he's really got amazing skill. Many of the songs in the Bible are songs of praise to God for his work of creation. Now, if you compare John, the, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, with Genesis 1, verses 1 to 5, you'll find some amazing similarities. Both of them start out with exactly the same words. In the beginning. In the beginning what? John says, in the beginning the word existed. Remember how Genesis says that God created things? With his word, by speaking. So John says that all things were made through this one, through the word. And then what was the first thing that Genesis says God created? Day one, God made light, right? And so John connects the word to light and says that light shines in the darkness. There are so many things from Genesis 1 and John 1. John 1 goes on to tell us that this one, he's called the Word, is actually Jesus. Jesus made the earth, and later he came to earth as a human. Jesus displayed the character of God. His words had power, like God's did in the beginning. When, when Jesus said to a dead man, Lazarus, come out, the dead man came out of his grave. Jesus gave names, like, you know, he gave a name 
gave Peter his name. Jesus judges. Jesus separates. The Bible is really, really clear that Jesus is not just uh, a man. He's not just a really good man. He's not just a prophet or a moral teacher. He is God, our creator. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 say, All things were created in him, in Jesus. He created everything in heaven and on earth. He created everything that can be seen and everything that can't be seen. He created kings, powers, rulers, and authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. Before him, before anything was created, he was already there. And he holds everything together. So you can see, just from, just from Genesis 1 and 2, we learn an incredible amount about God. All right. Now, do you guys have any uh, questions, comments? Um... No, said so. You demonstrated that God is powerful. Mm -hmm. He is strong. He can do anything he wants, and no one can stop him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have security. Okay. Mm -hmm. In other words, because we see God's God's power and what He's made, it gives us kind of peace if we know Him, right? To, that we we can we don't have to worry because we have a big God who's Okay. In the end, if we look at him as a father, that's where we really have it. Mm -hmm. He's a wonderful father. Sort of like that T-shirt I have that says, "My dad created your dad." <laughs> <laughs> it's a good T-shirt. Yeah. yeah. Let's see, um, we talked about how God created using His Word. How does God speak today? Through his word. Yeah, and what is his word today? His word is the Bible. Yes, yes. So, um, so when you want to hear God's voice, God's voice still has power, still can do miracles, still can change things. So when you have your Bible and, and you're reading it, and, and sometimes um, you'll suddenly get like an understand. You'll understand something you're reading. Maybe you've read it before, but it's like the first time you, oh, I finally see what that means. God's, God's giving light to your eyes. God's using his word to change you. God's word still has power. So when you are sharing um, the gospel with people who aren't Christians around you, people you know who aren't Christians, remember to use God's word because God's word is more powerful than, than your words. You know, now Our words are just our words, but when we use God's word, the Bible, when we speak the Bible to people, it can change their lives. It's guaranteed not to do that work that it's called to do. Meaning not to return in the void? So yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes, Isaiah says um, God's word goes out of his mouth, will not come back to him empty, but it will accomplish what he intended by it. That is good news. Okay, so we talked about what we learn about God. Let's talk about now what do we learn about, about humans, about mankind from Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, God is the, the main character of the Bible, but we do learn about ourselves, about mankind from the Bible and from these chapters. First of all, we, first we learn that we were made by God. We didn't make ourselves, right? Um, we are created by God. We can also see in these chapters that, that we, as humans, are the most important thing God made. We know that for several reasons. One is that we are the last thing God made. Humans are the last thing. The, the kind of the, the peak, the mountain peak of his creation, or the climax. Um, and we see also that we are significant because God gave humans authority over the rest of creation. He said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over the fish and the birds and the beasts and the, the crawling things. So. God gave, like God gave charge of the day and the night to the sun and the moon, but God gave us authority over birds and insects and animals and fish. God kind of delegated some of his authority to mankind. Another way we see that humans are special, or significant, is that God created humans personally. God, God himself blew into Adam's nose 
to give Adam life. And God personally was the first surgeon. He, he cut part of Adam's side and made it into a woman. Um, he didn't go to this much trouble to make anything else, to make any other animal or any other part of creation. Um, also, another reason we can see that we are special is the Bible says that God made man in his own image, right? We were made in the image of God. This doesn't mean that God has a body. It means we reflect God's characteristics. God can, can love and hate and show mercy and be angry, and so can we. And birds, you know, they can't do that. Uh, God can do good things. We can do good things. But cows can't do good things or, or bad things. Um, because um, like God, we have the ability to make moral choices. Animals, all they have is instinct. They don't have the ability to make choices that way. So that's why it's wrong. The fact that we are made in God's image, that's why it's wrong to murder a human. Killing a human is not the same as like killing a monkey or something, an orangutan that looks similar to a human, but killing a human is, is worse than killing an animal. Um, now, what do you think? Were both men and women made in God's image, or was it only man that was made in God's image? Yes. <laughs> was it man, just man, just males that were made in God's image, or both males? Oh, both. 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 That's right. Yes, both men and women were created in God's image. This means all humans, both male and female, are of equal value. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're an American or a Korean. It doesn't matter if you're strong or weak, smart or stupid. If you're human, you're of great value because you were made in God's image. The strongest, fastest tiger or the most beautiful bird is not worth as much as you are because you were made in God's image. And we have a soul. Mm -hmm. That's right. You will live forever. You will, you will continue to exist on forever, either in heaven or in hell, while the animals just return to dust and they don't have a, a spirit that continues living. God also shows something special about himself when he made us as humans, like he was kind of keeping part of himself um, conceal when he was making the other things and when he showed it when he made humans. He said, let us make man in our image. Wait a minute, I thought there's only one God. Why didn't he say, I'm going to make man in my image? He used plural nouns there. So this is a clue, one of the first clues we see in the Bible, that God is one, but his unity is complex. As we study the rest of the Bible, we, we see more clues, and we, learn, and we will learn that there is one God that exists in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And these three persons of the one God are, are different, separate from each other, but they're equal, and they're always in agreement with each other. All three members of the Trinity were involved in creating this. Before God made the world... God was not lonely because there were three persons in the Trinity. Three persons of the Trinity loved each other perfectly. They were perfectly happy with each other. So then, if God wasn't lonely, why, why did God create the world? What do you think? He created us for his glory, for his fame, for, 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 honor, for his honor. Like if you have um, a spring of water... It just keeps bubbling out more water. It keeps pouring out more water, right? In the same way, God continues to do more amazing works because he's infinite. He never gets bored or, or tired or empty or dry. God, God is always overflowing. And God has always been a merciful and forgiving God. But when it was just God in existence... He had no way to display his mercy and his forgiveness because God never needs mercy or forgiveness, right? Because he's perfect. So God decided to make beings who need forgiveness, that would be us, right? Um, and use us as a way to show how amazing his mercy is. 
Because for God to love humans would be about as amazing as for you and I to love rats or to love lice. (laughs) It is really amazing that God loves us the way he does. So we've been looking at you know, what, we've, what we learn about man from these chapters. you guys have any questions or comments on that part of it? Well, didn't you say that uh, women are, are just as equal as men, mm-hmm. even though the, the woman was made uh, second? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. We're actually going to talk about that in the next section. Yes. So why didn't God, if they're equal, why didn't God make man and woman right at the same time, right? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. Any other questions before we go on? Okay, great. So chapters 1 and 2 show us that God provides. All of creation, including humans, depend for life on God. God doesn't depend on anyone. God is self-existent. He needs nothing to um, outside himself to exist. We depend totally on God. If God was to, this can't happen, but if God was to go out of existence, if God was to disappear, we would too, because we depend on him for our life. And we see here in these chapters, God provides food. Um, at the end of chapter 1, he tells Adam and Eve, here's the food that, I, that you can eat. There was no death, and so there wasn't, no meat eating at this time. All they ate was things that came from plants, lions and humans and everything else. They were all vegetarians. God also provided a home for humans. He put Adam and his wife into a beautiful garden with plenty of water and food and even gold nearby. (laughs) Not that they needed gold, (laughs) but anyways, they had some. Um, God also provided work for humans. God told Adam to care for and to guard the garden. Work is not a bad thing. Work is not a curse. Work is not a punishment for our sins. God works, and he gave the gift of work to humans also. God provided also instruction. He told Adam not to eat from a particular tree. God's instructions are for our benefit. They protect us from danger and increase our joy. So it's, it's a good thing that God gives us instructions. Like Adam, we are dependent on God, not only for our physical food, but also for our spiritual food. We live, as Jesus said, by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And also God provided a wife for Adam. God did not make humans to be alone. We read many times in chapter 1, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. But when we come to chapter 2, God says something is not good. He said it's not good for the man to be alone. It, notice it was God that saw this problem. And Adam didn't recognize that there was a problem with him being the only human. But God saw the problem, and God set out to fix it. God, first, you know, he brought many different kinds of animals and birds to Adam, Adam gave names to them, um, but Adam realized that none of these would be a a suitable helper for him. Now, God could have named the birds and animals himself, but he gave that job to Adam, showing that he had given authority over the birds and animals to Adam. And so Adam had the responsibility to care for those birds and animals. God made Adam, as you know, God made Adam out of dirt, that God made the woman from the side of Adam. This shows that she would complete what was missing in the man. He made her, he didn't make her out of Adam's head because she wasn't going to be ruling over Adam. And he didn't make her out of his foot because he was not going to be ruling over her. He made her out of Adam's side because she was Adam's equal and she would be close to his heart. Now, although men and women are of equal value, the husband has responsibility to lead, and the wife's job is to help and complete her husband. 
That's what it means when it says you made her to be a suitable helper. Or maybe your translation says helper fit, helper meet. It means a suitable companion, someone who would complete what was missing in her husband. We know that God wants men to lead for several reasons. First of all, because man names woman. When God brings um, the woman to Adam, Adam says, um, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So he gave her both the name of her gender, woman, and then later in chapter 3 we'll see that he gives her her personal name, Eve. And as we saw before, giving a name is a sign of leadership and authority. Okay? So that's one reason we know that men were to lead in the marriage. Secondly, God made man first. Um, and then he made Eve to help Adam. He didn't make Adam to help Eve. Also, it was a a Adam who received the warning about eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God um, made Adam, put him in the garden, and warned him, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He gave him that warning before he made Eve. This shows that Adam would be responsible to lead his family to follow God's instructions. This chapter also shows us that there is something unique about the marriage relationship. Um, it's, it's unlike any other human relationship. The first recorded words of a human in the Bible are a poem, and they're a poem, a love poem about marriage. Uh, the Bible says that the husband and wife, when they get married, they become one flesh. It doesn't say this about you know, any other human relationship. You know, parents don't become one flesh with their children, or, or co-workers or friends don't become one flesh. Only when one man and one woman unite in marriage do they become one flesh. So because of that, that's why, for example, that divorce is wrong. God, when, God, when two people get married, God supernaturally joins them together, and this relationship can be ended only by death, not by divorce. This is also why uh, polygamy and homosexuality are wrong. God didn't make two women or four women for Adam, and he didn't um, make another man for Adam. He made a woman. Um, so on an even bigger scale, later on in the Bible, we'll see that marriage between a man and a woman is meant to be a picture of of the relationship between Jesus and his people. Jesus loves his people, the church, like a good husband loves his wife. Jesus gave his life to rescue his bride. So the church is to love and honor Jesus like a good wife loves and honors her husband. Um, okay, and so what questions or comments maybe do you have at this point? You mentioned that uh, if God was gone, we'd all be gone. Mm -hmm. How does that work? <laughs> uh, How do you think that works? Because, mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> that's a really good question, but it's all impossible anyways. But what I mean is um, God is the one that holds, we could say it in this way, God's the one that holds the atoms in the universe from flying apart. Um, if you want to think about it that way. God's the one that that um, keeps everything in the universe running. Um, we, we call them laws of nature because they're so regular, but God is actually the one who spoke those. Who, yes, who's in, and continues to hold them. Uh, by the word. Yes, by his word. It's still in existence. Um, so, you know, we think well, the sun gets up every morning because the world is spinning around. Well, why is the world spinning around? Oh, you know, because of um, conservation of momentum, right? Well, why is there conservation of momentum? You know, so at some level you get down to, well, I don't really know other than God did it, and it's that's why it's still holding together. So, um, that's a good question. Any other questions or comments? You're doing great. Thanks. So what we see about God in Genesis 1 and 2 should lead us to worship him for his creation. And I'm going to try to sing a bit of a song here um, that is one of many songs of worshiping God for creation. It's a, 
it's an old song, so maybe you have even sung it in your own language. Um, I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad, and filled the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command, and all the stars obey. Okay, I think we're out of time, so I will stop there. May the Lord bless you, and I look forward to talking to you again on our next lesson. Sounded really good. <laughs>